The Battle of Mount Sorel happened between June 2nd and 13th of 1916. Um, this is going to be a follow-up to the piece that we have done already on the Battle of saint Eloi and the standard battle strategies. So let's first take a look at where Mount Sorel is. And if you take a look, here's Ypres. And over here you'll see Mount Sorel is the number two. It's hard to see it because on your map it's kind of covered up by that uh, the the uh, big line here. But right here is where you are going to find Mount Sorel. Here's Saint Saint Eloi, just so that we have a uh, a frame of reference. <clears throat> by now, Canada has three divisions. We'll have four before the war is over. Um, so this is Canada's third division's um, blooding or, or trial by fire. And it happens at Mount Sorel, which is just outside of Ypres. Now this is the only, uh, well this, it, it's the high ground, it's the only high ground that is being held by the Allies, and it is the Canadians that are holding it. So on June 2nd, the Germans decided that they wanted to uh, take the last piece of the high ground, and they unleashed a furious bombardment at the Canadian position, at the same time exploding four huge mines under the Canadian position. If you remember when I talked to you about uh, saint Eloi, that this was the strategy that the British had used, and so this was something that was a fairly common thing to do. Whole sections of the trench line were completely obliterated. So the Canadian position on, on top of that ridge or on top of that hill was becoming pretty desperate. That's what the trench line looked like. Here is, you can see the trench line in through here, and you can see some of the connecting trench, uh, trenches in through here, and it has been absolutely devastated. Of the 702 men of the 4th Canadian Mounted Rifles, only 76 survived unhurt. PPCLI, which is the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, lost 400 men. The Canadians retreated from the hill. So we are in an unenviable position. We have lost the high ground. But for some strange reason, and we've never really been able to find out why, the Germans stopped the attack at nightfall. And what that did is it gave the Canadians an opportunity to regroup. So the next morning, the Canadian counterattack, uh, or the, the Canadians counterattacked, but that was beaten back. And then four more mines got exploded under their position. At this point, General Bing gives command of a second counterattack to the highest ranking Canadian general in the unit, and that is General Arthur Curry. Now, this is a guy that I, I don't understand why our history doesn't make a bigger deal out of this guy, because he is a bloody hero. Okay, so Arthur Curry is now the one who is going to plan the second counterattack. He knows the rules that everybody else is playing by. He cannot break the rules, so he has to figure out a way to make this into a victory, even though they have to work within that same system of the standard battle strategy. So here's General Julian Bing, and here is Sir Arthur Curry. So, Curry prepares his men meticulously. They rehearse their attack strategy several times before it gets put into action. He wants to make sure that everybody knows what to do, and quite frankly, what not to do. So, they start by ordering the big guns to open fire on the German positions. But then, they stop firing 
So what do the Germans do? They jump up, reman their positions, boom, hit them again with the big guns. So they go back down into their dugouts. The shelling stops, up they come, boom, hit them again. They do this four times. The fifth time, the Germans didn't come out of their holes. They're, they're sitting there going, no, 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 no. Fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times, but five times, no way, I'm staying down. And they stayed in their positions. And what that allowed was the Canadians to get across the no man's land, get back up the hill. And by the time the Germans had figured out that there had been a very long time between the explosions, the Canadians were already upon them. As a result, they were able to regain all of the area that they had lost on June 4th. However, it cost 8,430 casualties. It is a Canadian victory, but more importantly, Bing and Curry had learned valuable lessons, which they're going to use later at Vimy Ridge, which is probably one of the most significant battles that Canada not only has fought in World War I, but has ever fought. And I would even argue Vimy Ridge is not just the most important battle, but the most important moment in Canadian history. But more on that when we get to Vimy Ridge. For now, I want you to kind of marvel at how clever Curry had been. He still worked within the rules of that standard battle strategy, but he rearranged it so that he could effect a victory for the Canadians. And it's that idea of the brains over brawn that we saw first uh, uh, with uh, Sir Isaac Brock in the War of 1812. And now we're seeing it again. It's part of the Canadian identity that we have no choice. We'd better be clever. We'd better be smart because we're not very big. Okay, so that's the end of this one. And so at this point in time, you have got a really good idea of what battles would have looked like under, hmm, weirdly to say, normal circumstances. When next we talk, we are going to look at probably one of the most vicious battles, and that is the Battle of the Somme, but more on that later.